Hey folks, Steve here with a very special World in Flames video. Now, um, it's been a while since I've talked about World in Flames on the channel, and we just got over a very massive undertaking um, with the Dark Valley, and, and I was thinking, well, maybe I'd play some smaller stuff. I've got a lot of stuff that has come in, new stuff, stuff I'm kind of interested in. Um, sort of debating on what I wanted to play, and, and the last week has just been absolutely crazy um, with with work and life, and I, e even being isolated at home, all of that never stops for me. And so, you know, it's almost business as usual, only more so, um, even busier. So, I was, wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And then I was inspired. I was inspired. I was inspired by a couple of other YouTubers um, you know, I see YouTubers, you know, it's guys playing games, right? Like me and like others, um, who over this period of isolation due to the COVID-19 situation, um, started recording themselves playing World in Flames. And they're new guys at it. Um, I'm going to put the links to their channels down below. Um, a guy named Sean, uh, is getting through like the tail end of Victory in the West, the small... A uh, smaller scenario focused on Germany's invasion of the uh, Low Countries and France. And then uh, another guy, I think his name is, is Steven, but his, his YouTube channel is... Um, oh, gosh, I'm, I'm going to get it wrong. I'm going to... Um, hold on, let me... <laughs> I'm getting, make sure I get the name right, because I would feel terrible if I didn't get it right. Um, Moffat Field, which I think is a location. Uh, and that's the name of his channel. Not the person. Uh, who, who was also playing Victory in the West, that smaller scenario, and it just inspired me because it's been a while since I've, I've talked about it on the channel, this game, but I'm still playing or have been trying to play a game. Now that I can't go to my buddy's house where he's hosting, we haven't been able to play, so I'm kind of on a World in Flames um, drought, and I wish to, to, to resolve that, at least playing at home. Um, and, and, you know, for me, it was, I'd get to play once or twice a month, and so now, all of a sudden, I'm not playing it at all, and I need to rectify that somehow, right? So this is how we're going to do it. I'm going to play some World in Flames. Now, I need to set some ground rules here, right? Um, you know, this game for me is, I mean, the box is gigantic. This is a huge, this is the huge deluxe version with all the expansions, big heavy box, big crazy thing. Um... The, the thing about <laughs> this game is that I have... This is the collector's edition, the latest version of the game. I got Deluxe. I got the whole everything. This is my Omega game. This is the this is the Desert Island game. If I could only have one game, and this is a big game, so it's, you know, value for the, for the choice here. If I had one game that I could only ever have again, um, it, would, it would be this, or whatever the latest version of this, you know, if there's another version some years down the road. <coughs> because... Nothing quite does what it does to the same complexity and depth and ease of play because there are other games like a World at War that do similar things, but they're but they're um, harder to learn, harder to just to play. This is a very playable game, a very learnable game at, at that, and it's just it, it encompasses World War II in its entirety, and it's just great, right? It, it's absolutely fantastic, um, and for me, it, it is the the final game, you know, of all games, if I, if I have to pick one, this would be the one to pick. Um, and when it, when it, knowing that, <laughs> when I play with my buddies, um, I play the full deluxe experience, we have all the expansions, we pick a bunch of the optional rules, we're balls to the wall with everything. We, we're, you know, we're training pilots for our planes that are going on the aircraft carrier counters. I mean, we're doing the whole, the whole maximum complexity thing. But I realized that, you know, watching some of the newer folks playing the game, that, you know, they're, they're not ready to jump into that. And that's maybe how I started playing, because I just joined up with some guys who were, who were looking to play, and we made it happen, and it all worked out. And I learned everything, you know, as we went, and I was a voracious reader of the rule book, so for me it was, it was fine. But not everybody's like that, and, and a lot of people are going to want to start with the classic game, the base game, and probably not play with a lot of options. And in fact, that's how some of these guys were playing uh, Victory in the West. And so, um, one, to make it saner for myself in terms of time commitment, even though it's still a huge time commitment, 
um, and so that there's less fiddling around, so more gets done in each video that I would record of this, I'm going to be playing a classic game, meaning no expansions. I'm going to use as few optional rules as possible, so it is the most base form of the game possible. You know, and here, here's the, you know, insert joke about being basic or whatever, if you get that lingo, but um, I, I try to maintain that, you know, when I talk to people about World of Flames, that if you just wanted to play the classic game, it's, it's, a, it's a fine game, and, well, I'm going to prove it. I'm going to play a classic game of World of Flames, but I have to put another sort of control over what I'm going to do here. I'm going to play just Europe. I'm just going to do Europe. I'm not going to do the Pacific. We're going to use the Americas map because you have to have that. Um, but just for table space reasons and, and just because I want to focus on the, the playability of the game, I'm just going to do Europe. Part of the other sort of reason why that is is that once you've put the Pacific map up, I kind of start leaning towards wanting to do the deluxe thing, right? Because I want all the aircraft carriers to have their own counters and I want the CVP planes, the CV planes to have their own counters, and it just drags me back into the deluxe mindset. And I want to avoid that, and I think the Europe-only map, with just playing with the base counters, no divisions, none of the extra units, um, will, will provide just a more encapsulated experience that can be enjoyed, especially if you're a viewer. And so we'll, we'll look at all of that as we get moving here, but I just wanted to lay down the, those ground rules, and, and we'll figure it out. Now, um, that doesn't mean Japan doesn't show up. In fact, in the scenario in, in the game uh, where you opt to play uh, with Europe only, there is a mechanism for Japan and uh, the other allied powers, navies off, off map, basically, off the Europe map. So there is some stuff that we'll look at. There will be some Japanese counters that we will be using uh, in the game. But um, we'll, we'll go from there. The other thing I'm going to do uh, as a part of this is I'm, I'm going to be talking about strategy. I'm going to be talking about you know what I'm thinking as I'm setting up things. We're we're going to kind of go full depth on this, and then it may take a long time for it all to start churning, right? But what I want to do is I want to do setup and talk about that setup as we go because I think that is a is a challenge for newer players who just kind of don't understand how you go from punching counters to playing the game. That there is some ephemeral, you know, uh, weirdness to knowing how you want to set things up. And so we're going to include that. So we're going to do the setup. I'm going to read the scenario instructions, and we're going to set up the game on camera over time. It's going to probably take a few videos, um, but I want to do that because I think it's really important that folks understand how to do it and why I might put units in certain places and just my overall thinking uh, for, for the game. I think that would be really helpful to people. And then once we get past that initial introductory setup set of videos, which again might be several, um, then we'll get into the game itself, and you will get to see a full, you know, Europe European war played out from Poland to Barbarossa and beyond, and eventually to uh, the fall of the Axis powers. Very likely, unless something crazy happens, and I call it for the Axis. Unlikely, but we'll we'll see. Um, so, yeah, that's what we're going to do, and how I'm going to help facilitate some of that is I'm going to move this big honking box off. I'm going to start that by looking at my counters here, right? So, these are my classic game counters. So, I, I have an entire chest full of with related game counters, many of which have been organized into little boxes. Those are all of my deluxe stuff, like my original set of counters I got with the game. So I bought the game, got the deluxe edition, I got all the basic counters, I got all the expansion counters, I punched them, I organized them. You can find videos of that on my channel of setting up the deluxe compartments for all the counters. All of those are off in a way. I then, you know, some months back, had purchased a, a second set of classic counters. You can do that. You can just buy the counters from Australian Design Group. And, and I bought it so that if I ever wanted to do this, just play classic, I could do it without rummaging through my deluxe counters. And, and only, only a crazy person like myself has the, the wherewithal or the um, passion to do such a thing, but th there you go. So, in these regular uh, GMT-style 
uh, counter trays are all the counters for the classic game. I've got the Axis stuff over here. I've got the miners and the, uh, the random other uh, smaller country stuff here. And I've got uh, the allies, most of the allies over there. Um, the counters are not well organized. They're basically just, you know, a country. The country stuff is all kind of together. So you can see I've got like several little compartments of Americans. That's all the American stuff. They're not necessarily ordered very coherently. And so what I'm going to do with that is um, we're going to start to take the counters out of these compartments, or at least the ones that we really need to, like the major powers. And off on another table, um, I'm going to start setting up the force pools. And that's really kind of the first important aspect of the game that y you need to do if you're going to play, right? Now, me just setting it up in these counter trays is not enough. You really have to have some organizational space to, to start kind of piecing together the game. This is something with my camera goofed up, so I'm not sure uh, when exactly I lost you, but, but basically, you know, this game is so big, make no mistake, that it is a huge game, um, that, you know, I have a very decent-sized, I was to say very big, but, you know, it's not that big, I mean, it's pretty big. I have a decent-sized game room um, where I can set up all the things that I need to set up. Um, so, just fair warning, you know, if you're looking to play this game, you, you will need plenty of space not just for the maps but for the force pools of all the units and having them in an organized fashion you really want to keep them organized there are a lot of counters even the base game is a fair number of counters but things like the miners you don't necessarily have to set up until you need them um, and a lot of the administrative counters are obviously you know use as you need them or set them up um, there there is sort of an organizational step one could make to organize the counters by year because the game counters are sort of added into the mix uh, on a year-by-year -year basis. So, um, you know, as each year goes by, there are new units that are added to the powers force pools. And we'll look at how that organization is going to play out here. Um, we'll look at that on camera again. My, my desire here is to kind of get you set up so that you can do all of this. If you're a newbie, Really, that's what who, that's who this series is meant for. Um, if you're new to World in Flames and, and you need help understanding just how to get the game going, I'm going to help you do that. Um, and if you're an experienced World in Flames player and you just want to watch someone do it and then you want to watch the actual turns that I'm playing as we work through the game, um, that should be of value to you. Uh, the Europe-only scenario is 35 turns, so that is a lot of gameplay um, to cover and... Um, it's going to take us a long time to do. I may do other video series alongside using other table space for smaller games, but I'm just so struck by inspiration, I really want to give this a shot and see how far we can get. So what I'm going to do from here is I'm going to put a cut, and I'm going to prep some of this stuff so that I can show you on camera more, more, more fully um, what we're going to do. But again, if you're looking just at your own counters... I you know I've largely just organized the organized these by country by power by you know if they're administrative counters all counters like that that are similar together um, really straightforward easy stuff like that and it really should not be um, a, a big deal for you to find the counters that I'm picking up and situating um, the way that I need to situate them to conduct this setup so um, we'll see you here in just a second. Okay, real quick, I want to talk about what I'm going to be using to facilitate the, the campaign that I've chosen to play. You can kind of hear my printer in the background. I went out, and I recommend new players go out to the Australian Design Group's website. We just put in Australian Design Group in Google. You'll, you'll find it. It's kind of a weird URL. It's like a-d-g.au.com uh, or something like that. Um, and I and, and you want want to do that because in the download section you will find the errata for the game. Now a game this big does have some errata. Now thankfully, you know, they tend to keep the PDFs pretty well updated with the latest errata. So what I've done is there's a PDF of the setup charts. So you can see here I'm looking at the two map campaign, Fascist Tide, War in Europe. That's what we're playing. September, October 1939 to May, June 1945. And you can see They've got all the setup information there, which um, <laughs> we'll talk about here soon enough. On the flip side, it continues on. 
And, uh, if, you know, just it happened to be on this page, the Day of Infamy Pacific Theater setup, but we won't be using this. We'll just be needing this section right here for setup. Um, and you can see there, there's, uh, it's a little hard to see, unfortunately, because the way that the, the cells were set up and like spreadsheet or however they ever, they did it. If you look up here, it's going to say location and then what unit types. Now, when you're playing the basic game like this, you basically read da 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 da, -da and then you stop right here. So for our purposes, we're just going to be looking at this you know, if you look, like this half of the sheet, because everything that my hand was covering are stuff like offensive points. I am not playing with offensive points. Now, to World and Flames veterans, that's going to sound crazy because offensive points are some big part of the game. But they're an optional rule, and I'm going to try to stamp down any optional rules uh, in my playthrough. Then there's additional stuff, like whatever additional uh, planes and flames aircraft from an expansion... Uh, if you're playing with ships and flanks, there's a bunch of extra ship counters you need to look at, and then a bunch of divisional type stuff, and territories and flames, and a bunch of other stuff. We're just going to ignore all that. We're going to look at just the basic things that you need in the game. And, and just to show, uh, sorry, I keep bumping the camera, there are HQ units, there are armor, there are mechanized, there are motorized, regular infantry, militia, garrisons, and then other land, which is going to catch stuff like paratroopers, um, and cav and other weirdness there. That's what you, you will see. Um, and then for planes, which is what you see here, there are fighters, land bombers, naval bombers, and air transports. The numbers here, the two, three, sometimes four, represent their length of turns to build. So there are uh, different types of fighters, and that is um, going to determine... Uh, from what subset of your units are you actually going to get. Um, and let's see, I could actually probably show an example of that. So, um, or I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, here we go. So, whoops. Here's an Italian bomber. It has a three build time. That is a unit that would be in the three column of the, uh, of the chart there. Um, and then you have uh, here the naval units, which they're usually going to have just a handful of these guys, and then they're going to point you usually to some sort of note where the rest of the ship names are lined out in a longer line that wouldn't fit in a column. And there tends to be, you know, if you're a power with a lot of naval units, um, there very well could be a lot there. So um, watch out for that. You might be digging through some counters depending on what type of game you're playing. And then we have, I just have the, the from the latest errata PDF. I'm not sure there's actually any changes that were made here, but this is the fascist tide war in Europe uh, scenario information. So this includes all the basic stuff. We're going to look at this in more detail here very shortly, but it lists out all this stuff. It talks about what the production is for each power, um, and then whatever special rules might be in play. And especially because we're playing Europe only, there are some special rules that are detailed um, to represent all the Pacific and outside of Europe stuff, like a transfer pool where there are units. Um, Japanese raids, and that's what I mentioned, there are Japanese units in the scenario, and then a few other, other bits of information, as well as some player guide camera goofed up again. But yeah, that we're going to just use those two sheets to, to set up the game and... Um, we're going to be good to go. Okay, so let's get started with the really basic administrative counter setup because I think that's the easiest place to start. Um, so I have uh, what you see here is the production circle. If I zoom out a little bit, you can see. So this is um, a, a standard uh, play mat that's going to be out. And you're going to use it quite a bit. It holds a lot of uh, basic information um, for keeping track of things. Uh, I have my map over here, and as you can see, like, you know, the Europe map is still pretty big by itself. The Americas map, which is at a different scale, obviously, I just set up over here. I won't need to use it a whole lot, but there will be times where I need to move things about from America, uh, convoys, and different things like that. Some important stuff to point out is in the bottom left of the America map, um, Americas map, 
is the weather chart. So this is where you represent what the weather is. Um, and there are six weather zones. So uh, Arctic, North Temperate, Mediterranean, North Monsoon, South Monsoon, and then South Temperate. Now they have some neat little pictures there that show what the clear terrain is uh, in that region. So uh, re uh, weather can sometimes be fine, sometimes it's rain, storm, snow, or blizzard. Uh, and what you have is a certain number of these counters over here. And if some region is not fine weather, then you would place, you know, whatever it was. So Mediterranean snow, unlikely. Arctic snow, north temperate rain, fine in the Mediterranean, things like that. That's how you represent it. And, and weather is pretty important. Weather has a lot of impacts on combat and movement and supply range. Um, obviously, it's, it's a big deal. So some people like to use, like, cards that they can place in the region or near the region to help mark what it is. Um, I probably won't need to do that because I'm pretty familiar and, and good with, with weather tracking, but um, the real thing that matters here is that on the player aid charts that you have, there is a weather chart. Now I'm going to zoom in so you can see this is a little bit better. So, um, of the player aid charts that you have, there's a whole bunch of stuff, right? And we'll get to looking at these as they become important. Um, but here is the weather chart. So basically what you do is, uh, and, and you're going to do this quite a bit when you play the game, you look at what month it is. So each game turn is two months. We're going to start in September, October. So we would be looking at this column. And basically based on a die roll that can be anywhere between 1 and 12, um, you're going to get a different set of weather for the regions. Now it can be, you know, you're rolling a D10, so how you get a, an 11 or a 12 is that some weather results give you an asterisk, which means, or, or sometimes two, or I think in some cases, you know, three is possible. That's where you add one to the die roll. And so that's how you get the 11 or the 12s. And what matters with the weather is that um, it's going to tell you for each zone what it is, fine, rain, snow, whatever. It's going to have a number in a white circle, which tells you how many uh, boxes the impulse marker moves, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, and, and basically, a, a simple way to understand it is, terrible weather will make the box slide more, or make the marker slide more boxes. That, in effect, shortens the turn. And I'll explain that very, very shortly. And so you can kind of see that here um, as it goes, right? Really bad weather is going to give you a blizzard and storm and all this, and it's going to move three boxes. So turns will be shorter in the winter. Um, the game setup, the chart itself that we look, right, it says, you know, the first turn is September, October 1939. The weather, uh, last weather modifier is none. The die roll for the first impulse uh, of the game is a four. So if we look at a four and we look at September, October, we can see it's fine everywhere. F, 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 fine in all weather zones. The marker will slide one box per impulse. Now to show what that is, is the impulse track. So when the axis goes, axis will go first. We'll slide the box one. Then the allies will go and they'll slide the box one. When it comes back to the axis, they will roll the die for a new weather result. So it's not every impulse, it's every pair of impulses, essentially. So usually if it's like, we, you know, the first side to go on a turn will always be the one rolling weather whenever it's their impulse, basically. And that weather will hold through the next impulse from the other side, and then you, again you roll. So at least the first impulse, we have fine weather. If we look at the weather chart again, just to see you know, fine, 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 fine. But if we start rolling a five or higher, that's where things can start to get a little rougher. And really what the Axis hopes to never get in these early months of a war is uh, the eight, nine, or 10, where there's storms or snow, that's really gonna slow down their offensive. If you're an offensive faction when playing World in Flames, you really want weather to be good all the time, right? Because that, as long as the weather is good, your offensive capability is sound. If you're defensive and you're defending, whether that's the allies in the early game or the axis in the late game, you will want the weather to be crap and you will want the turns to go 
fast so that uh, you're less susceptible to enemy interference. Um, a few other things with the basic markers. So uh, there is a note here for uh, initiative. So initiative, axis marker in the plus two box. Axis starts with the initiative and must take the first impulse. So we have the marker here. It is a uh, black sort of trim counter on one side, blue on the other, showing the Faxis powers. Um, and their the symbol they're using is a, oh God, I'm not going to say it, like a fasc fascies? fascies, which is an axe of, I don't know, it's hard to describe. It's really weird. Symbol for fascism. Um, it's on the plus two uh, box, and it is axis initiative. Basically, when you roll on a new turn, each side will roll a d10, and wherever this marker is, will apply a modifier to one of the die rolls, basically meaning the axis has a good chance with a plus two to defeat the allies in the initiative roll and being able to continue to go first uh, on a turn. So uh, we also put the year marker in 1939, pretty basic stuff. You can see these orange boxes for 1936 and, and so on. Those are there in case you were playing with Days of Decision or Patton in Flames, which are sort of expansions, neither of which are really fully compatible with Collector's Edition without some house ruling, or at least some figuring stuff out, which hasn't been done yet, but it's sort of future-proofing uh, the game, game components here. Down below you also see a markers track. Uh, we'll get to that when we start putting other stuff on the board. Uh, but for now, we will ignore it. But basic any mar you know basic markers will go on here. It goes up to 24, and then you can have, you know, you can flip the counter, and it'll usually say plus 25 or whatever, and you can count up again from there. Over here is the production circle, and um, typically, you know, everything that's on here is public. I, and I've heard of some people, you know, if two people own the game, then one other guy will bring his copy of this overall chart here and they'll do like blind production where the axis can see their production and, and the allies see theirs but they can't see each other's um, and I can see reasons why people would do that but uh, I've always played it with just the single production chart it, you know you can look at what your opponents are building right it's sort of like a inference of intelligence and you can see like oh Germany keeps building a bunch of amphibious landing craft. I wonder if they're going for sea lion. <laughs> you know, you can sort of see that on here. The basic idea is the turn marker shows you what the current turn is. So we're in September, October. Uh, the turn marker will go here. Next turn will be November, December, and we'll just keep moving it around the circle. And when it gets to Jan, Feb, uh, we will increment the year marker, showing that it's 1940. When we get to building stuff, which will be far from now, um, this will be where you put units that you are building, um, and at setup, when we get to setup, there will also be units placed on different slices of the pie here um, that are units that are set up to come as reinforcements in a given month as per the setup charts. Uh, how it'll work is, like, if you build a unit that takes three turns to build, you're going to count, you know, from the turn that it is, so if we built something at the end of September, October, and we, we it's going to take three turns to build. We go one, two, three. We're going to put that unit on the March-April slice of the pie. Um, nothing takes longer than six turns except for ships. And ships kind of have their own method of being built that's a little bit different than others. Um, so like an aircraft carrier is going to take two years to build. Um, the first cycle is going to take one, two, three, four, five, six. When you get the whole way around the circle, um, that unit will go into the construction pool, and then if you choose to continue building it, it will then take another one, two, three, four, five, six turns to complete. Um, so there are these triangles in the corners. They're to hold units as sort of as sort of holding boxes. So uh, the construction pool are those half-built naval units, units that have completed their first cycle of building. They go into the construction pool. And when they are chosen to start being finished, then they'll go back on the, uh, the spiral here. Repair pool is where damaged naval ships will go, and they will then be taken from the repair pool and put back on the production chart when they've been selected to be repaired by spending production on them. A reserve pool 
that is where things can go. Um, you can you can choose to put reserve units there, um, but that is really more useful when you're playing with deluxe counters and you're putting like, you know, if you're when you play with certain deluxe optional rules, you build planes and you train pilots separately, and you could have planes that don't have pilots yet. Those extra planes might sit here until you're ready to put them on the board. And then there's the Lend-Lease pool, which um, when you have an exchange of units via Lend-Lease, you put the exchange unit that isn't in the game anymore over here. So for instance, um, there might be a American bomber plane that is Lend-Leased to the Russians. The Russians will put uh, their counter into play, and then the U.S. equivalent of that plane would get moved out, basically, out of the game and, and placed, I think, there... I think that's where you, that how that's supposed to be used, um, and and you don't you know I, I might not even worry about putting it there ultimately if we don't do a whole lot of that we'll see, um, so that kind of does it for the really just basic basic administrative counters. Now there are other markers that are out there. Uh, there are markers for offensive points, but since we are not playing with offensive points, I will not be using them. So no need for those guys. There are uh, other game markers like these factory markers. If you are trying to build a new factory with optional rules or the factories are destroyed or you're railing factories out as the Russians and you need to represent that, there are counters for that. Um, there are basic counters for if convoys have been forced to return to port. You put this little CPUs marker on them to show that they can't just simply be put back out to sea. Um, on the other side of them are other game counters. Uh, this is like a no planes counter, so won't be relevant for our playthrough. Here's a damaged marker for ships. On the back side is, again, multi-purpose counters. So you have some of those oddity uh, markers, but there's really not that many administrative counters uh, besides those ones. Um, there are partisans, which I'll show later. There are also U.S. entry markers, which we'll, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. So I'm going to put a cut here and we'll take a look at that. Okay, so we'll eventually, when the time comes, go into a deeper dive on U.S. entry. This is something I would have really liked to have made a, a sort of um, uh, educational video or tutorial video about U.S. entry, and I've not gotten around to it, but we will dig our feet into that a little bit, our hands and feet into it, eventually. Um, so there are these counters here. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can see them. Um, there are these uh, American flag markers here. Now, when you're playing the full game experience with everything, the Pacific included, there are going to be um, players other than the U.S. player who are going to get these chits. So in some ways, I would rather them not have U.S. flags on them because they're used by more than just the United States, but they're um, used to track... Uh, uh, they're used to track um, how likely it is for nations to go at war. If you're not the U.S., if you are the U.S., then for the most part they're being used to track how much the United States is gearing up for war, being, you know, leaning towards joining the Allies. It's kind of a comprehensive system, and we'll have to take a closer look at it as we get playing. For now, I just want to call out that this scenario has some stuff that need to be talked about. So it says entry markers, only the GE slash Italian pools are in play. So that all that is saying is we're not going to have a separate pool for the Pacific Theater in Japan. We're just going to have a European access uh, pool to worry about putting markers into and spending markers and enacting U.S. entry uh, events. All markers in the pool count at double value, so we'll need to keep that in mind. The U.S. starts with two entry markers in the entry pool. And before Jan Feb 1942, the U.S. may not pick an entry marker in the U.S. entry step if it picked a marker in the previous turn's U.S. entry step. From that turn on, the U.S. may pick one marker per turn. So, for now, all you really need to worry about as we go through this, if you're following along, is before uh, the U.S. is basically at war with Japan, um, they're only going to get a free entry marker every other turn. Um, ordinarily, they would get one, I think, every turn, but um, because of the, the special rule here and, and playing Europe only or whatever, they're, they're basically only going to get um, a marker 
uh, every other turn is effectively what is what that is looking like. Um, there are other things that allow you to get U.S. entry marker chits. Uh, they come down to basically political uh, consequences of the war, um, and and I've likened this in some ways to like a role playing game. So if you're if you're the guy at the table playing the United States, you kind of have to be in this mindset of like role playing as the U.S. President and Congress and the American people of, you know, d does the United States care that Germany invaded the Netherlands? Well, y you roll a die, and if the die roll goes your way, you'll get to pull a U.S. entry chip. Um, and that's effectively representing whether or not anyone knows or cares. And, and if they do care, that's good, because the more U.S. entry chips the U.S. can get, um, the sooner they'll enter into the war. Sometimes, if the Axis is very successful, that may cause the U.S. entry to increase at a more rapid uh, pace to sort of, you know, in some ways it's almost like a control on the game um, by getting the U.S. in earlier. Um, so there's almost like a mini game of are you going to piss off the, the Americans? Um, you know, what are the odds that you're going to piss off the Americans? Is it worth the aggressive action that you're taking in the game um, for the possibility that the U.S. will enter the war earlier than expected, which means, like, you know, in, in World in Flames, the U.S. can actually declare war uh, on the Axis before Pearl Harbor even happens. And, you know, that can be very beneficial to the Allies, but they can't just do it. They have to do it through the U.S. entry system. So, um, what we're going to do is, because the U.S. starts with two entry markers, um, we, we're going to do that. Um, and I believe, based on my reading here, the U.S. will also, they're going to start with two, and they're going to get to pull one in the first impulse during that step of the turn that is not right now. Um, this is just to start. So the way I have these organized in my counter tray is um, all the U.S. entry chits for up through 39, and then when it comes 1940, you add these chits to your you know, collective draw pool, and then there's 41, 42, and 43. So basically, I just need to pull you know, two at random. Um, so I'm going to I'm gonna not look at this. You guys are going to not even see it because my hand's blocking the way. So I'm just going to draw, I'm like mixing them up, and I'm just going to draw two. Now, I'm playing this so well, which kind of defeats the secrecy of the game, but there is a sort of secret element where not everybody knows how much uh, U.S. entry is in the entry pool. Um, the U.S. player will know, but not even their allies are really supposed to know. Here are the two chits that I drew. So um, I, I drew a 1 and a 3. Sorry if the lighting and the focusing isn't working for you. 1 and a 3. So a total of 4. Now, um, there is a box for this over here at the top of the America map section here. So uh, you can see there's a entry pool and a tension pool. And this is the German-Italian box up there, and I've put them, sorry, the camera's not quite centered, I, uh, I put them up there. So, um, again, if, if I were playing with other players, those would be face down, nobody would know what's in there. I'm playing myself, so it doesn't really matter, and you're a spectator. So we know, we all know, whether we're supposed to or not, that there is four entry value total in the German-Italian uh, entry pool. Eventually what will start to happen in the game is that uh, the Americans will get enough of these points that they can then basically sort of earn the ability to enact a U.S. entry action. Um, and these will be things that allow them to either provide uh, lend-lease benefits to the Allies, lend them resources and build points. Um, it will allow them to build more stuff because uh, the U.S. actually has a great amount of limitation on what it can build at the beginning of the game. That is, again, something we'll take a much closer look at when the time comes. But basically, um, I think the U.S. can only build naval units uh, until they start passing some of these U.S. entry actions that allow them to recruit armies. So think of that as, you know, implementing the draft. That's one of the options and mobilization and all these different things. So the U.S. starts really far away from the war not on a war footing, not on a war economy, and over time the U.S. will start to ramp up towards that. Um, 
Okay, so I think that's all we need to look at here for just the moment. Now we can start looking at uh, the force pull stuff that I talked about before. So I'm going to take myself off camera and I'm going to move the camera to another table where I'm going to be trying to organize uh, the force pulls and we'll see how messy it gets from there. So we'll be right back. Okay, see that pile of green counters right there? Well, that is all the U.S. counters, uh, unit counters, and, and a couple of other uh, chits. In the game, that is the classic World in Flames game, meaning no, no expansions. That's a pretty big pile. That is a pretty big pile of stuff right here. Right. Now, I'm showing it to you this way because if you're just punching counters at home and you're playing this for the first time, you're going to end up with big piles of counters like that. I'm not really sure how you want to go about organizing them <laughs> or even setting them up to play the game. Now, because we're looking to actually play the game, one of the steps you need to take here, and, and again, you, I suggest all new players actually just go and read the campaign book. It tells you how to do setup. It tells you all the, all the things that you need to do um, to set up the game. Um, so this is really just a, as an addition to that, but but uh, just to put it in real terms, right? I just have all the U.S. units there in a big old pile. So you could punch your counters, put them in a pile like that. But if you're actually looking to play the game, if you don't store them in any particular way, like again, I did that for my deluxe game for the classic counters I have as a separate purchase. I just kind of have them in a counter tray. Um, I'll eventually put them all back when I close this game up, whenever that might be, a long time from now. Um, but you can go from this pile to being able to get rolling and playing, but you have to set up the force pools. Now, the, the campaign book talks about how you set up those different force pools. There's a lot of different ways you can lay them out, um, and it is ultimately however works best for you and the other players in your group or whatever you're doing. Some people like to print out little uh, mats to set counters on, um, again, when I play with my buddies, it's usually either we're picking them out of a counter tray or we've set them all up on some separate table and you can just go and pick them up and it comes time to, to buy stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a cut here and this pile here will be turned into some organized piles and I'll talk to that in just a second. Okay, I'm partway through the United States and this took, mm, I'll say 15 minutes where I separated from that pile all of the 39 and earlier earmarked units over here, all kind of laid out. And over here, I've organized the eventual ads by year. So over here, let's see if I can get my finger on camera, there are the 1940 units in two stacks, 41, 42, 43, 44, and 45. And now I have it set up that way uh, so that when it's 1940, I can grab those two stacks. I can add the individual units because it's all land and, and uh, naval and air all in the piles, not organized. I can just add them to the existing force pools because that's what you do. Um, it is these remaining units here that need to be organized into uh, the actual force pools. And what you're going to do... Um, is and this is my recommendation if you're just punching counters you got piles of stuff organize by those years that I just showed and if you want if you're willing to organize and and store your counters a certain way whether it be baggies or or um, bead you know craft compartment uh, tool compartment uh, plastic boxes whatever take those year units and organize them that way in their own little containers. So all the 43 units in one, all the 42 units in one for that faction, so that when the year comes up, you can just pull those and organize them. Then your base 39, because most of the time, if you're going to play World in Flames, you're going to play from 39. The rest of your 39 units, you can organize however which way you want, but at least you know this is what you can start building, or this is the set of units that you're going to initially um, do set up with. And so um, all those other units won't matter. I did make two other piles here worth calling out, and we'll see if I can get it to zoom or focus. So over here are the pile of op point counters. I won't be using offensive points, so those will simply sit there unused. And then you can see I've got piles right there. Those units with the 10 on them, um, those are convoys. And they, they don't, years don't matter for them. 
Uh, when you're playing classic World in Flames without the expansions, they come in denominations of 5 or 10, and you build them in denominations of 5 or 10. And so I just have them all over here. I'm going to start with some as the United States, and then if I build any more, they're just going to come out of that pile. The year doesn't matter. It's almost like its own force pool, um, and I basically just need to make sure that wherever I have these counters, I just have the right change. If I'm down to 5, or if I'm at 10, I flip it down to 5, or if I bring it back up to 10, you know, I just need to use them like change, but all the convoy counters I have over there. So now, what I need to do is just organize the remaining counters, and I'm going to do it by type and type of unit, basically, and, and build cost. And this doesn't take up a whole lot of space. You can see, like, yeah, the United States, you know, I picked the United States because they're the faction with the most units, period, uh, in the game. The next would be probably the, the Russians, and then maybe the Commonwealth and the Germans and whatnot, but this was a good example. Uh, the thing with the Americans is they don't have a whole lot of 39 units, where if you look at Germany, Germany's going to have a whole lot more 39 units, 39 and earlier, than the Americans. I think it just works out that way. So we only have so many here that we need to organize, and the actual amount of table space it'll take up will be, you know, really not very much at all, and I'll show that. So I'm going to put a cut here, and I'll spend a few minutes organizing the counters in a little bit more coherent fashion. The one thing I'll point out is, amongst this set here, are going to be naval units that are going to start the game on the map according to setup. So I'll probably organize some of the naval units a little bit differently than just in force pools because of them. Because some of them, again, will start on the map. Some of them will stay in a force pool where we could build them. Um, so I just I'm going to organize knowing that that's going to be the way it works out. So we'll be right back and I'll show you what's what. Okay, so I cleaned up the American units and I have them sort of set up uh, in two lines here. Um, now, a couple of things, and, and these are kind of weird goofs. I'm, I'm going to do some research on. I'm going to reach out to a couple of experts and just validate. Um, but I know that there are certain naval units that are set up at the beginning of the game, and the, the campaign guide has a key for these little letters that are on the back of certain units. So here's an example. Um, oh, God, it's not going to focus, is it? Uh. So on the back of this uh, unit, the Pensacola, is an M. And that M denotes where it gets set up, which is the east coast of America, the United States. So um, most naval units will have this marker uh, across all the factions and might be like, you know, an E for Europe or something like that, or a C for construction pool, R for repair pool. Um, and because it's a named ship unit, it will start in a certain place. Now, the actual setup charts, uh, the latest official ones that are on here, for some reason the Pensacola, which would ordinarily start on the East Coast, is not there um, in the setup charts. I'm not sure why that is, and there's a few other units that are sort of missing. If you were playing the global 1939 game, meaning, you know, both maps, Europe and Pacific, um, a few units would be noted as coming in as reinforcements on future turns, um, as well as being in the construction or repair pool. And for some reason, in this two-map setup, maybe it's for balance reason, I'm not sure, the Pensacola is not included in the setup, and um, the construction pool and repair pool units are not listed in the setup. So for now, I'm going to put them out of play, and once I get a clear answer, you know, we'll, we'll address it. Uh, in a future video uh, when I get an answer back and whether or not they're supposed to be somewhere. But for the actual units that are potentially in play, here's what I've done to set up. So uh, there's a little bit of a glare, so and I apologize for that just due to the lighting in the room. Um, there are going to be a stack of units here that are going to start, that are listed as part of the setup uh, on the east coast of the United States. I just have them stacked here, and then there is one unit that's in the construction pool the Wyoming, uh, and the Arkansas, which I have right here. So classic World of Flames ship counters represent two capital ships with the names on the front and back, and then an assortment of other escort ships are included in the counter. So uh, that's why it's two names per counter, basically. So just that you know, stack and that one unit here are the starting naval units of the America... Uh, uh, forces of the, Ameri the American Navy. However, 
Um, there are other units that we will pull randomly to supplement that Navy. So that's transports and potentially some subs. If I look at the chart, we're going to pull two transports and one sub for setup, and they're over here. So basically what I've done is I've set up a pile for each force pool. I have the reserves noted here, because there's not very many of them, regular militia, which will matter when the U.S. is at war, uh, HQs in a pile, regular infantry in a pile, motorized in a pile, mechanized infantry, armor, garrison, fighters, bombers, naval bombers, air transports, and then down here, it's a little hard to see, but paratroopers, mountain units, uh, mountaineers, uh, cavalry, subs, transports, amphibious units, and then the other buildable naval units that are in the force pool. Uh, there's an aircraft carrier there, and then a stack for uh, surface combat ships, you know, your battleships. And they're all organized, again, by the type. Um, for the Americans, all the build times and costs and all of that stuff are all pretty similar, so they can all be in a stack like that. So whenever we get to production, or when we go to setup, and it calls for uh, pulling a certain unit. So let's just take a look at the setup chart as an example. Um, the chart's going to say for you to pull one two-build time FTR. If we look at the top of the column and just trace down. So as part of our setup, we need one fighter. Well, what, are, what we're going to do is, when we actually go to do the setup, is we're going to go to our fighter pile right here. We're going to throw them into a cup or shake them up in my hand because there's only two. That's easy to do. I'm going to draw one and I'll zoom out so it's a little bit easier to see. I'll draw one and if I drew this one, then this is the unit that will get set up on the map. So um, I'm having a hard time focusing for this P-35. Almost, there we go. The P-35 instead of this uh, P-36A, which is slightly better. So I drew poorly. Um, this one has a four combat ability as opposed to a three. So you can see the difference. The P-35's got longer range, but that may not matter a whole lot. So we got to, you know, we get to set up one. We drew randomly out of the two fighters because we get to set up one fighter and it's going to be one of these two. So if you're lucky, you'll pull this one. If you're not lucky, you'll pull this one, I guess, is the way to look at it. Um, now, sometimes you'll look to set up a unit, and there's only one unit of that type in the force pool. Then you simply use that unit. Um, and so basically, you'll want to do this for every faction. Now, again, um, it took me probably, in terms of actual sorting, um, maybe 15 minutes for the Americans, and they're the biggest faction. Now... I know what I'm looking for. So for you as a new player, this could take a little bit longer if you've never organized your counters before. For me, I recognize the silhouettes on the back of the units. I recognize the NATO symbols. I'm very familiar with that. I can tell what's what. I have a way in my head. I like to organize things. So it took me not long to do the largest faction in the game, 15 minutes. You can imagine, you know, if you're going to do this for the, you know, six other, uh, let's see, one, two... One, two, three, four, you know, five, six, or whatever major factions. Yeah, it's going to take you a little bit of time to get this set up. Once you do this for every power, and I'm going to get it all on this table I'm looking at right here. Each faction is going to get set up over here. Um, it's going to be much, much easier. Once you get this initial set up over here out of the way, picking out the stuff that goes on the map and drawing and building and all that stuff, it all becomes easy once you have it into these nice little piles. You know... All of the mechanized units are right here, and when you want to build one or you need to place one, you can go right to that stack. You can pick one out of the bunch. And again, as the years go on and new stuff is added, you'll just take stacks and uh, place them on the piles that you've got here. Now, for some factions like the USSR, they're going to have a crap ton of infantry. You may need a couple of stacks or, or organize a little bit differently. Um, I know some people use things like Dixie Cups. Uh, to kind of organize them. Whatever works for you, you know, but you will want some level of organization. Again, separating them out. And I'll, again, I'll just show so you can see what I'm talking about. HQs, infantry, motorized, mechanized, armor, garrison, 
uh, you know, paratroopers, specialty infantry or their own force pool individually, and then the different Navy and air types. Um, so, yeah, kind of straightforward, not a huge deal there, but a critical component of setting up the game correctly is getting all of this set up. Um, and as you start looking at other factions, you know, factions with less naval units, this gets a lot easier because you're just dealing with infantry and ground units that form very easy to identify force pools. And smaller factions like France will take much less time to set this up. It will not be very hard to set up as needed. Um, so yeah, there we go. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop uh, the video here. And in fact, I, I'll, we'll call this a completed video and I'll start getting this uh, uploaded to YouTube from here. What I'm going to look at next time is we're going to come back and this table that I have uh, here will be covered in force pools of the major powers. Um, I'm going to move some stuff around, make some room and, and everything. Uh, but we're going to set it up and have this kind of covered encounters and neat little piles. Those will be our force pools. And what we'll start doing is the official setup on the map. So all the time it's going to take for me to organize all the other factions like this you guys won't have to watch me do it or, or have me talk through it. I'm just going to do it off camera um, over time. It shouldn't take too terribly long. Once I get that set up, and again, since it's just Europe and Japan, um, it shouldn't take me too long to really get organized, uh, we will be able to um, get into things. Now, there's one other thing that um, I should mention, is that uh, the setup guide for uh, the... Americans uh, in the in the chart says to scrap certain uh, marine units. Um, let me just double check which ones those are. Scrap the first and third U.S. Marine Corps. So the Marines are actually up here in the year reinforcements. They don't. Uh, the U.S. doesn't start the game with any Marines. Um, when they come up, I'll just take them out of the game. To scrap uh, means to remove from the game, and there are ways for you to scrap units in your own force pool, and you will sometimes want to do that because older units, once they get old enough, you can scrap them for free, and scrapping them, or you can just get to scrap them, period. Scrapping them removes them from the force pool, and you might ask, well, why are you reducing your force pool? Well, once you have enough stuff in your force pools and you go to build something, you're going to draw randomly from that force pool, paying the cost, and then you're going to pull. You might get a crappy unit, you might get a bad unit. Well, the newer units that come in in the year, uh, newer year pools are obviously better than the older ones. And by uh, trashing um, certain, certain units, scrapping them rather, scrapping the older units takes them out of the, the gene pool, so to speak, right? So when you go to buy an armor unit, you're not going to buy a really old armor unit. You're probably going to be more likely to pull the newer, stronger ones because you've scrapped the older stuff. So um, to help reflect the fact that the United States has Marine units in the Pacific and we're not playing the Pacific, the first and third Marine Corps will be removed from the game when they come up. So you know, when the time comes, I just organize them. They're in there somewhere. When they come up, we'll simply remove them from the game because they are not meant to be there. But the second and any other... Marine Corps units, um, we are we will be able to build as the United States in our European game, and we can put them into effect if we want to. So, yeah, there we go, guys. Um, we're gonna we're gonna get the ball rolling here. It's gonna take some time. We're gonna do setup. We're gonna work it all out. Uh, we don't need to set up China, so that's one thing we won't need to worry about, which will be nice. Um, but but plenty of stuff to do here uh, to get the game rolling. So we see you. We will see you in the next one, guys. Um, take care. Keep on gaming. World in Flames. It's awesome. Check it out. Later.